Good afternoon, folks. Uh, we're so excited to have this conversation. Uh, this is something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, my name is Matt Aubrey. I'm the Executive Director for the Organization for Responsible Governance. And I want to thank all of you for uh, being here and, and, uh, and hopefully participating in this really important dialogue. Um, we have an incredibly uh, uh, talented group of folks today that are going to be able to speak on uh, a topic that we hold very important at the Organization for Responsible Governance, which is the impact of civil society here in the Bahamas. Um, just as a, a bit of a background, um, well, actually, just as a bit of, of, uh, of uh, housekeeping, um, we're going to go through two sections of the presentation of this of this session. We're going to have our experts kind of present some of the findings of a very recent report. We're going to have some folks that are here in the Bahamas as leaders of civil society organizations who will speak about and respond to it. And then we'll provide an opportunity for all those folks that are participating digitally to be able to also pr present their questions. But ongoingly, if you have thoughts, comments, questions, please put them in the chat because we've got folks uh, that are checking that and we'll respond and we'll kind of hold those aside so we make sure that we are able to respond to as many questions and comments. Um, this is a, uh, a collective process. So uh, we understand that there is a lot of lived experience that is sitting in this. And I look through the audience of attendees. Um, so we want to hear your thoughts. We, it's something we need to fully understand. And so perspectives that might not have been reflected are really key. So we encourage those and, and let's make this as, as interactive as possible. Um, just a quick background to ground us on, uh, on wh who, who we are and what we're doing. Uh, the Organization for Responsible Governance is a not-for-profit here in the Bahamas. We uh, have a principal focus of promoting the principles of good governance. And we do that by engaging, actively engaging civil, so civil society, the citizens, and the private sector in accountable governance. Because we know that when that happens, we facilitate more inclusive and more sustainable social and economic opportunities. Um, we do that in a couple of ways. We, we benchmark laws. We look at and make sure that the laws of the country are fair and transparent and reflective of the best standards and of the people's interests. But we also know, uh, like our Freedom of Information Act very recently, uh, that that can sit if it is not paired with a very active and engaged citizenry. So we also put a lot of energy in. We're out in the in the in the community doing grass works, grassroots work, training citizens, giving them the opportunities to get involved, to utilize and reclaim their voice. Um, but we also know that the systems in place are are kind of static and aren't as responsive. So we facilitated some ongoing communication tools. You can check them out on our website, our policy review center. Uh, which a quick plug for tomorrow, the Ombudsman Bill is supposed to be debated tomorrow. So uh, if you have some thoughts and ideas about it, make sure to let those that you've elected know so that they can reflect that in their, in their debates. Um, but finally, we know that changing the world is a very daunting task. And so as we prepare citizens to get involved and become informed, we also know they need places to go. And those places are best when they're dynamic and mission-driven and well-organized and sustainable. So we devote a, a good bit of our time to building the capacity of civil society organizations, and in this instance, very specifically, not-for-profit organizations. And that means that, that all the folks here and all this work really is part of a, an important process of what we see as positive and sustainable national development. We have a more vibrant civil society sector. There's more resources and tools that can address the many challenges that the Bahamas is facing. Um, quick background, we have been working in this space for a while. And prior to Dorian and COVID, we actually did an exercise with Mark Palmer and funded through uh, Templeton to map the sector. And we were able to validate that there were 800 plus organizations that were operating. And, and, and if we were able to get some fun, additional funding in time, we had a sense it would probably be over a thousand. And that was pretty exciting because it could we could do a lot together. We held our first couple of civil society conclaves and that brought us great results. But Dorian and then COVID changed the world. And then subsequently there was a law that was passed. The, the government was really um, needing to respond to the uh, financial action task force recommendations that there needed to be stronger regulations for our sector um, so the not-for-profit the not Act was passed. 
We did a lot of advocacy, as did Civil Society Bahamas and Wana Luther and a number of groups to ensure that it was a good piece of legislation. But it then required that all not-for-profits had to re-register. So the platform and the landscape definitely changed. We took our old list and we compared it with a list we were able to get from 2021. I'm sure uh, Atwal will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, the Registrar General has not given us any more updates since then, but from 2021, we saw that there were 1,064 registered not-for-profits at that time. When we compared our list to that list, we only saw an overlap of about 300 plus. And the, that meant that there were a lot of other new organizations that had been formed, many that were connected to churches, it seemed like. And so there still is a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, we have developed out some thoughts and plans about how to move forward on this action. And after this session, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it. But it it really garnered the, the, the thought to say, what is the scenario now and what has been the impact of civil society here in the Bahamas to date? And we uh, got some funding from Templeton Religion Trust. Uh, I want to give a shout out to, I see some Templeton uh, representatives on, on, the, on the call. So we're glad to have you aboard. But we also went and sought some folks to help us to do that. And the folks that we went to help us to do it are world-class. So let me go ahead and quickly uh, get into introductions and hand it over. Um, our, our, our consultants on this process were Sanogest International. And Sanogest International is a, a really powerful and dynamic team led by Etoile Pinder, who is an incredible daughter of the Bahamas, but her impact is far beyond that. Um, she, uh, in addition to leading as the president and founder of, of Sanogest International, she also uh, serves uh, with UNICEF. Uh, she is on board of Brief. Um, she was recently an incredible fellow uh, that that uh, that we we just saw that. Um, and I have a feeling that more than my fingers and toes is about the countries that she's had an impact in. She's very, very well connected. Um, and she's worked with us in the past and knows the sector. So we were very excited to have uh, her on board. Um, we also, though, were joined with some of her team members. And, and so joining us in addition to Etoile uh, is Jose uh, Pacheco. And Jose has over 20 years of professional experience in health and economics and education and all kinds of social justice work. Um, he was a former vice ministry of finance. And uh, so he sat on a number of different sides. He's been in the private sector as a, a member of the board of directors of the Central Bank of Costa Rica and has been an incredible consultant who's also worked in about 35 different countries. Um, he has great experience in microeconomics and macroeconomics and poverty and inequality. So as he will illustrate, looking at our context here in the Bahamas, he's see, seen it from a number of different perspectives. So we were extremely happy to have uh, them aboard. They did some incredible work under difficult circumstances. Um, and I think we have some really powerful things that that have come out of that. So. So uh, the portion of me talking a lot will now end, and I want to hand it over to uh, Etoile and, and Jose to lead us through the rest of this uh, this bit of the session, and, and we'll see you after they finish to introduce our panel of local experts. Fantastic, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm going to spend my five minutes messing everything up while I try and share my screen. Hopefully it will function fairly well. Um, can one of my other panel? Yes, perfect. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, so first of all, no, of course I got a phone call. Um, so after that exciting beginning, uh, I want to just say thank you both to Org um, for having created this space for all of us who um, work within and care deeply about the not-for-profit uh, sector within the Bahamas. I can see on this participants list, <laughs> I think it's like 50% of you were some of my focus group discussion members, or I had key informant interviews with. So I'm not too sure how much new information is going to be here, but I do hope, like Matt said, that, that us being able to present the results, which is really a triangulation of the quantitative survey data that Matt and uh, the org team had collected from all of you using online surveys and all of that, in combination with the qualitative work that we did, and then a desktop review of some international best practices on how to be able to measure and look at what the impact of CSOs in a country can be. 
I also want to start off by saying that there's not a lot of great literature about looking at civil society as a whole and really putting a, a socioeconomic assessment around that. And probably it is because it is quite difficult when we look at the range of CSO activities um, that are being covered. So we have everything from environmental uh, players who are potentially having an impact now, but definitely having an impact for the Bahamas 25, 30 years down the line. And it becomes quite difficult to give an economic value um, to that type of impact. So I just wanna put out there that when we're getting into the numbers, I'm gonna say this line a lot, it's an underrepresentation about what the real value of civil society in the Bahamas is doing. Um, <clears throat> Matt's already given a great uh, sort of overview view there of the project background. Um, a little bit too, uh, some of you are very familiar with it, but so for the data collection methodology, Matt and the team did quantitative survey. And then I traveled, it was not just Nassau centric. Um, I did travel to Eleuthera, um, Abaco and Grand Bahama uh, to be able to do in-person interviews in those islands and then had some virtual Zooms with some folks who were in other family islands. So it's not just Nassau based. We were really trying to look at what are these factors both influencing uh, CSOs, what are the characteristics of them in the country, the ones we were able to, to include in these interviews or the survey. One of the key things, it's a socioeconomic uh, assessment was what's going on with funding? How are we getting funding? What are those challenges to funding? What can we do moving forward in the future to be able to improve funding opportunities? Pache is going to lead you through the financial impact and those types of things. One of the things we were able to do was ask uh, folks about what their impact on beneficiaries was, like how many beneficiaries they were serving, what are the types of timelines that they're serving them within. Is this that I'm giving out a school backpack at the beginning of the school year? Or am I running a feeding program, which is being sustained? Or like Keisha and Wonderful Hands for Hunger, they've got a, a pantry where folks can go with dignity and go and ensure that they are they are having enough in their in their food uh, budgets. Um, and finally, this last bit, which I know will then lead into the the panel discussion, the the next panel discussion, and then finally into the Q and A, is how can we expand and strengthen the CSO sector here in the country? It sounds a lot. I promise you're not going to have to listen to me too much, though. I, I hope to promise that anyway. So a little bit is what we want to be discussing is what is a CSO, which are community-based and non-governmental organizations, which their goal is to have some sort of impact on a beneficiary, multiple beneficiary socioeconomic conditions, health, and educational outcomes. And this is sort of a, a generic big picture um, a generic big picture definition. As we talked about, we use this mix of quantitative and qualitative uh, data collection methods to be able to look at both the institutional and the beneficiary perspective on this impact of CSOs and do the big desk review of, of the variety of data points. Um, and then we had the web survey of beneficiaries to actually see, so you tell me that you're having this type of impact. What do your beneficiaries say that impact is? Uh, we did get uh, we did get 87 uh, individuals to respond to the benef beneficiary web survey. And again, thank you to all of you who were promoting it within your beneficiary networks. We shared it. We gave out super value uh, gift certificates to sort of randomized uh, to certain people who had participated. So that was great. We had the focus group discussions and we had the 124 respondents from the quantitative survey that was done. Matt touched on these briefly, but I do just want to reiterate them. So there's four big picture things that I think that we can talk about are impacting how CSOs are able to function on a daily basis, how they're able to sustainably think about growth, how they are able to interact and have an impact on their beneficiaries. So one is definitely this institutional and legal framework. And 
sort of the flux that we've been in with the last five years with changes to how all of this gone has gone down um, with the MPO Act and actually being required now to be registered to operate in a specific way. Um, we know as well, though, if you want to be able to open a bank account, you again need to be registered. Um, if you were able to go through the process of becoming VAT exempt uh, for some of your goods and supplies that you're bringing into the country, you need to be registered. I would say that from all of my discussions with you, it's clear that there are still some laxes and some hiccups in here. A number of folks are were still evolving, knowing that also this work started two years ago from being still registered as a for-profit company to becoming registered as a not-for-profit. Um, and so I think Matt, just for us thinking about as a future point and question and answer time is how has that change now occurred? How are people feeling? I know it was a hiccup for UNICEF in 2019 when we were trying to give out grants to certain in uh, really they are CSOs, not-for-profit organizations, but because they were still registered as a for-profit company, they weren't actually eligible for UN financial support. So that I think is still an interesting thing to think about and put into our Q&A session later. We cannot underestimate the impact of the fact that when we did this study, it was right in the middle of COVID and it was right after uh, Dorian had hit. While we know that Dorian's particular impact was in Grand Bahama in Abaco, and again, great to see, I, I know that uh, Friends of the Environment are here and I see Juliet is here. Some of the, the Abaco folks are well represented. Um, but it wasn't just those islands. There were the there was the population that then moved to New Providence, the population that moved to to Eleuthera, some to Exumas. So while the direct initial impacts were felt in those two islands mainly, the repercussions for the beneficiary pool in particular in a number of the other islands also changed. And it changed our overall macroeconomic indicators. So our nominal GDP and higher uh, than average inflation rates have continued and are persisting, even though we are now getting into five years after Dorian uh, in September this year. And well, we all know COVID, I'm sure somebody knows COVID who got, somebody who knows COVID <laughs> that was positive in December, at least the pandemic aspect of it ended, but its influences economically are still being felt. The fiscal environment, again, being uh, impacted by those things as well. So our public debt as a percentage of GDP continued to grow. And in 2023, it was 86.6%. Um, we're aware of what these things mean then when the international bodies are looking at us. It means a whole bunch of things about how easy it is to be able to ca get cash from certain things. And it likely would mean that we're going to see that these changes then in the amount of grants that are going to be available from government or subsidies from government. Um, so these sorts of things are going to have an impact on CSOs. And finally, just the labor market, uh, the, as we have continued to see not great uh, employment levels, that means extra beneficiaries requiring food assistance, educational assistance, assistance with transportation, so many different things. And it also means for those in the environmental sector that the work that they're doing is that much more critical because again, if we're thinking about the long-term impacts of climate change and the impacts on our, our ability to be able to have agriculture to, to fish our, our reserves here, these things are all gonna be impacted. So just noting that these are the big four influencers that we've put on for this particular study. Now, there are other things that would be impacting us as well, but these were the four key ones. So I'm gonna give you a little bit about what we looked at in some of these, these things. So one of the things, despite us doing it at, as a national level, it still rep is reflective of our overall population in the Bahamas and over two thirds of the CSOs that responded had New Providence as their base of operation. Now, one of the key, key, key factors here that I think, um, is worth as diving into as well is that 20%, so one in five, were not a formal legal entity of any type. 
And it's not easy for us to tease out, is this because of the growth that CSOs had in the following of Dorian and uh, during COVID? We know that so many individuals stepped up to be able to assist with provision of goods after Dorian and continue with provision of food and various things in their communities. And so is that still going to be the case in five years time or was that just a pocket? But again, remembering that that 20% of organizations then are not eligible for any real outside funding grants. They're really just looking for donations of in-kind assistance that then they are being able to do or services, whatever it happens to be. Um, but it, it does restrict their ability to grow. It restricts their ability to be able to get funding in. And only 68%, which is what I brought up earlier, of the responding uh, CSOs said that they were actually a formal incorporated not-for-profit as opposed to being registered as a company. The pretty little graph here just shows you what the breakdown was of our sort of sectors that folks are working in. So 6% in advocacy, just less than 10% were health focused. Arts and culture, 13%. Uh, Social services, which is obviously quite a large area, 16%. Uh, Education, science and technology is 27%, which does include uh, environmentally focused uh, CSOs as well. Size, probably no surprise here, small. Over 60% of the CSOs had less than five employees um, and a, around 50% relied entirely on volunteers for their day-to-day -day operations. So it's not really a surprise, right? This is, we need to get something done. I've maybe got one person that is being hired as a manager, but then for all the other activities, I am asking volunteers. Um, I often joked for a long time that with brief, I was an involuntary volunteer because Katrina being one of my best friends, I didn't really have an option. I had to volunteer. Um, and I know that because of our our small networking here in the Bahamas, it works fairly well. It is not as easy for sustainability. It's not as easy if you're trying to write a strategic plan for growth. If you're trying to talk to foreign or international donors about how you want to step and increase, they, they may want a little bit more of understanding how your volunteer basis works. Additionally, membership. So because of the types of CSOs, and I'd say there was probably a bias in the ones that responded to the surveys, um, over 80% did respond that they had members. And for 50% of those, so about 40% of all the respondents said that they had at least 50 members. What that membership entails, there wasn't, there was a small proportion only who were actually getting in monetary membership fees. A lot of it was more just like, yes, I am a member of, but I wasn't paying anything to be a member of it. However, those membership pools often used, again, for that volunteer basis. Okay, so challenges to funding. Not surprisingly, getting money into the CSO sector is difficult everywhere in the world. This is not just the Bahamas, it's not just the Caribbean, it's not just LACRO, it is everywhere. Um, I have done a number of projects with PAHO looking at CSOs throughout um, 15 countries within the region. I've looked at this in Europe. I've looked at it in other places. This is not new and unique to us. However, one of the things, I'm gonna to move to point three, one of the things that we are lacking here is the type of financial incentivization that exists in a country like the United States, where if I, as a formal for-profit company, give a donation to an NGO, I am able to use that as a tax write-off. And we are missing some of those formalized incentivization. Um, so I will continue to say that I think there's extra room here for us to advocate for that to the government. While we want to remain as non-governmental organizations, there are still structures that can be put in place and things that can be eased by the government that will help with this. Um, the dwindling and intermittent financial support from the financial from the public sector 
It's a tough one, right? I, the harsh reality is, is that when we know all the issues that our government is facing in terms of having sufficient finances to fund our healthcare system, our educational system, upkeep our roads, do all the various things that their main focus as a government is on, it means that when they are facing increasing expenses and reduced revenues for their side, one of the easiest things for them to cut on their cost side is their provision of services, uh, financial service or financial subsidies to the CSO sector. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way if we are able to get across, actually, if for every dollar that you invest in the CSO sector, you are going to get a return on investment of X, Y, Z. That's sort of what I know Matt and I have been talking about in the big picture of is where can we use these, these um, economic uh, persuasive points to show the government that actually, instead of cutting the funding to CSOs, you may want to think about it. Again, it's kind of a little dicey line because we all want to be able to remain as non-governmental entities that we are not being influenced anyway by whatever the current administration is and that our beneficiary pool remains uh, our beneficiary pool. But there are still things that the government can be financing that should not be influencing us as non-governmental organizations. And we see that there at the bottom. So, and again, it's not really a surprise between Dorian and COVID, we had this contraction of our economy and not surprisingly, therefore, in terms of absolute numbers, the government grants decreased by over 20% from the 2018, 2019 period to the 20 to 2021 period. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Pache to lead us through even more numbers. Thank you very much, Edwal, uh, for this first part of the of the presentation, and thanks all again to Org for for the opportunity to share comments. Uh, I just want to to extend the, the the previous slide in terms of what what's the the context uh, situation and how this may affect uh, funding uh, to NGOs and uh, CSOs in the next years. Remember that we have exactly two situations right now that prevail in, in the world after, after COVID. The first one is that due to the uh, increasing uh, budgets that uh, governments approve in order to face the situation, um, debt grew uh, exponentially. So there are no government in the world right now uh, that is not facing uh, fiscal problems, fiscal pressures. And it means that uh, right now, the debt burden is the highest in the world as no any other uh, period in the recent recent period in, in, in our society. So this is important because uh, we can envision that in the next five to 10 years, most of the gov governments will be uh, working in reducing debt and it means reducing the spending. So the, the, it, this is important not only for Bahamas uh, and the government of Bahamas, but for the rest of the governments, because if CSOs depends also and on international funding, this situation may affect the availability of, of resources in, in the next uh, few years. And the other one, it's important to, to remind that uh, even though uh, the con some economies are recovering from a post-COVID situation, the labor market is not doing the same. I mean, we observe a recovery in many of the indicators, labor-related uh, indicators, but uh, it's interesting that in terms of this recovery vis-a-vis -vis what the GDP has been doing, the labor market is it's not turning back uh, to the same situation we have in 2019, 2018, okay? And so this may affect also the evolution of the economy uh, in, the, in the medium terms. And I, I consider this could be relevant. I read uh, in one of the, of the government um, uh, public finance outlooks that the government is, is pushing to move public debt from this 90 plus 96% of GDP to 65% in the next years. 
And this type of adjustment requires a lot of efforts, not only to increase revenues, but also to control spending. So this is one of the issues that I consider important from the cost context perspective for you to have in mind. Uh, next, please. Okay, so in terms of the distribution, and this is something that we are going to see also in, in some more slides uh, ahead, uh, we have two or three big categories of uh, CSOs from the pers from budgetary perspective. The first one is that about one third, well, 30 percent, 28 percent of the of the CSOs that we analyzed uh, receive or have set a budget the below. 15,000 per year, okay? And on the other side, about another four, one, 20, 25% of these respondents um, said that they have budgets, annual budgets over 250,000 per year, okay? So it means that in, in, in the overall map, what we have is a set about half of the, of the CSOs with a, small or medium medium size budgets and we have uh, just a portion a proportion of them having budgets over 250. It doesn't mean that this is enough to cover all the needs and all the purposes of the CSOs. This is important. This is just a mere distribution of resources across the organizations. But perhaps if you ask even those ones with uh, the highest budgets, maybe they are going to tell you that uh, for the for the needs uh, they 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 are facing or they are um, diagnosing, uh, maybe they are having some some complications and uh, they they lack uh, behind what they require. Uh, important to say this because at the end. Uh, from a developmental perspective and not a financial perspective, this analysis is quite relevant in order to, to uh, outweigh the, the real financial situation of the organizations, okay? So the analysis shouldn't be only if I receive one or 10 or 15, is how much can I uh, uh, solve or, or uh, finance with the budget I'm receiving, given the needs of each one of the sectors. Please. Next one. Uh, the second issue that we were also um, estimating, well, that was one of the major lines of the, of the terms of reference was uh, the weight of a CSOs in the Bahamian uh, economy. Okay, you see some basic numbers. Um, because we receive information as a range and not as a point uh, a figure, uh, we estimate that if we considered we add up all the the, the, the budgets of the respondents uh, in total, okay, the sector um, on an average year may may be uh, budgeting between thirty point five and twenty three million dollars. Okay, so it means that. On average, each CSO is budgeting right now about 165,000. And in terms of GDP, that would range between 0.12 and 0.21. These numbers should be taken uh, cautiously in the sense that we are just adding up all the, 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 the organizations who participate and respond to this financial section. So mainly, uh, Basically, what we consider is that this number should be much more higher than what we have here, in the sense that there are still some a uh, share of the organizations that uh, should be added up in order to have a complete map of, of all the budgets in the sector. Okay, please. And I'm just going to reiterate that again, okay. that if we'd actually gotten data in from 800 to a thousand organizations, you know, and we're able to do a lot more data points, this would vastly shift. So that's just, just to reiterate that. Okay. And then we, we move to the second part. As I told you, I mean, the financial profile is important in order to have an idea of the size of the sector, but it's a, even more important to know exactly the, the potential uh, links between this funding 
and the well-being of the, or the persons and communities that receive the different services. Uh, in this case, we, we work out with uh, an online uh, survey and we also prepare some visits to the different islands in order to collect qualitative information uh, coming from direct respondents, people who, who were a uh, direct, uh, direct beneficiary of any of the goods and services that the different organizations delivered. Please. Okay, in this regard, we have, uh, again, two broad categories of, of organizations. About one fourth of all the organizations that we have, from which we have information, um, have a total uh, or less than 50 people benefit from their uh, their projects, okay? On the other side, we have about one third of all CSOs having over 1,000 beneficiaries as part of their portfolio, okay? Important to mention is not only the size of the population covered, that is really important in some sense, but also the effects that the same people who receive the benefit uh, respond about the uh, how the participation in the different programs uh, affect their living conditions. Put it simply, 58% um, of this group uh, respond having a significant improvement in, in their living conditions after uh, participating or receiving the benefit from the, the CSO, okay? And 57% uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the need was completely met depending on uh, their particular circumstances, okay? So this is a, a, a large share. Um, perhaps one important issue to consider here in terms of governments, governance and administration is that uh, it seems that in many cases, we still require uh, formal mechanisms to measure these this effects, these impacts. In this case, we are asking uh, beneficiaries about how they perce perceive the, 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 the effects of the, of the interventions. But uh, in order to uh, formalize this, it would be important to have a mechanism, a monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to measure the, uh, the change in the indicator or the, or the, or the area of interest for, for each community or each uh, CSO in order to have a baseline and then uh, 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 a measure of how this initial number change after this intervention, okay? And sorry, Pache, I keep on interrupting you, but I don't know if we have it on a later slide. So I I do wanna hone in on this. This was something in the focus group discussions um, when I was discussing, there were only a few organizations that really had a five-year strategic plan that involved them having set what their objectives were, what proportion of people they'd like to do X for, do Y for, or the environments that they'd like to have an impact on or schools or whatever it was. Um, and I think being able to do some more work on these monitoring and evaluation frameworks will again, eventually with having strategic plans, these types of more formalized documents will help all of the CSOs in country be able to access more international financing, bring it into the country and not just be dependent on domestic sources. Okay. I don't know if this one is for you at all or, <laughs> or for me, but I can do it. Yeah, Pache, you go for it. Thanks. And then we summarize the defects, the positive of effects of CSOs in the Bahamas, given both the, the focus groups with different uh, communities and beneficiaries, and also from uh, talking with direct, uh, directly with or some organizations. Things that uh, emerge of a uh, recurrent um, of, um, positive effects or, or benefits from having this work in the Bahamas. Uh, the first one is that um, CSOs are regarded as a cost-effective way to implement social programs. So there is a, a, a positive valuation of the work 
uh, of these organizations and this, uh, not only in, in terms of the, of the direct contact with the communities, but also in terms of cost effectiveness, okay? So first to say that uh, even in not only the social, but also in the economic realm, there are, there are um, distinguished benefits coming from, from, from their operations. The second one is that uh, CSOs are also uh, envisioned as uh, organizations that may first uh, generate job opportunities. So there is a space there to uh, increase the, the, the number of, of employed people in the, in the country. The second one is that uh, they perceive CSOs as a channel to uh, enhance a citizen involvement, okay? And the second one is that they are critical um, pieces of uh, operation and organization during emergencies. And given the, the climate change effects that uh, the Iceland uh, has been um, experiencing in the last years, these, uh, uh, let's say, grant or uh, CSOs and unique um, status and, and role in, in the context, particularly of uh, um, improving the, the situation of communities after a, a, an emergency comes, okay? And finally, there is, a, a, there is a perception that through CSOs under uh, represented groups, migrants, for instance, uh, young people, um, they, they may have the possibility to have a voice and to receive those social services, those social benefits that perhaps they cannot be receiving by other means, okay? Definitely, and only because Matt and I are currently working right now with NEMA to really be able to work on a better framework for CSOs, NGOs in the Bahamas to be able to do both emergency preparedness and, e and emergency response work. I know I have a bias being with UNICEF, um, but I really do feel that that is, is a particular strength of the CSOs that we saw play out after Dorian. And it would be great if we can continue to work on what occurred to then so that in the next storm that we're that much better prepared and have better networking between our CSOs. Okay, and finally, it would be uh, interesting to discuss later with you about uh, the, the, the potential agenda for the next years in terms of changes and reforms. Uh, interesting to say, for instance, that in terms of capacity building, the online survey showed that uh, the first issue that uh, CSOs consider is of critical importance for them to improve is the capacity to fundraising, okay? So this issue plus what Etoile already commented in terms of improving uh, skills in terms of strategic planning come to be the, the first two areas in which uh, CSOs consider they should receive more uh, more uh, training. And just to say the other one, the access of financing, that was the only, the other one that we were discussing uh, before. Um, I would say here that uh, given the, the context that I explained before in terms of the fiscal, uh, the, the real fiscal space to uh, increase grants or the possibility of accessing um, funding from international sources uh, right now, this may complicate the situation. It may take, it may, it may be the, or, or we can have the opportunity right now to start at least uh, evaluating the possibility of uh, looking for non-orthodox uh, sources of financing. And this is a channel, this is a way that some other governments in the world has been working in order to expand the, the possibility of having more funding without a necessary depending or on grants and other, 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 other sources. For instance, uh, I know uh, that uh, to, to finance some uh, projects in Africa, uh, the, the OECD and uh, private, private investors have been designing 
uh, what do they call the blended finance uh, type of models in which several sources, okay, they just allocate resources for one particular project and um, one organization manages the the the, the source the, the resources and provide the service according to to the needs of the of the community so we have right now uh social bonds we have green bonds we have impact investment we have blended finance so there are there is a, a list of potential uh new sources or non-traditional sources of, of, of funding that at least it is my opinion the 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 CSOs should start evaluating if there is any possibility to get money from these new 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 sources. In some cases it is important to, to say it here we are dealing with private investors aiming at invest sorry for the <laughs> repetition, but it's it's a, a group of private investors having money for developmental purposes. So uh, it's not the type of commercial bank um, a loan or, or similar mechanisms that we all know, but in this case, they are private people looking for a developmental projects and they will agree with the organization or, or the government to provide uh, not very low, but lower uh, lower uh, cost of their resources if if you achieve uh, a significant improvement in, in the living standards of the community. So this is something that you can explore and, and look uh, if if there are uh, you have the conditions in in the Bahamas to uh, proceed in this way. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining and for being so attentive. I already see some questions. My name is Arianna Wells. I'm the Engagement Program Manager at the Organization for Responsible Governance, and I will be hosting the Q&A segment. Um, so I'm sure, well, I already see some questions, so I'll just start from the beginning. Um, and if you have a specific speaker that you'd Mariana, like to answer. I'm so sorry. Question. Just to quickly, uh, we are still doing the, the panel with um, Kiran and Keisha. Okay, we can do that first. Yeah, sorry. We're just going to gonna. No problem. Jump out. I, 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 I didn't, unless that changed. I'm so sorry. Oh, I just see the Q&A. That's fine. Oh, okay. Um, no, I'm oh, sorry on the slide. No, I, I sorry that was I think that was more just a we we will ultimately get questions that can go back and forth to the to the the speakers, but I think we were going to do the panel and then go back to an overall Q and A where anybody could be asking anything related to either the the, the Santa Jess speakers or the um, uh, or the panels if that's okay. Great. Um, so uh, first off, uh, Etoile, uh, 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 Jose, I really appreciate the perspectives and the work on that. I do want to kind of, again, provide the rider that this was done in really challenging times. Uh, I don't think we were fully in in-person stuff, so a lot of it was was limited. Um, we also were able not able to travel as well. So there clearly were pockets of, of uh data that we wanted to gather. The, the study we did, the research, the survey lasted for, I think, an extension of about nine months. And we tried every means possible to uh, incentivize folks, whether it be giving prizes or calling them up directly or working down our list. But as as we saw with the, with the not-for-profit uh, act, that also changed the landscape. And so folks may or may not have been able to respond or uh, might have not uh, been a part of this. So there definitely is a, a, a linchpin for additional work that builds on this 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 base of understanding. Um, but it, I think it's critical that um, we uh, kind of absorb it and, and think about it as, from a sector perspective. And so I'm really excited to have the next two folks join us um, uh, to kind of share their thoughts on, on what they would have seen and, and what they take away from this presentation and its implications. Uh, and then that will open up an opportunity for us to 
kind of have a much more broad discussion with everybody's perspective. So um, do do hold on there with your ideas and keep them come keep the questions coming in the chat. Um, so I uh, was really proud to introduce the, these two speakers. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, Keisha Ellis, who is the executive director of Hands for Hunger. Um, she's also a professor of political science um, and the author of one of my favorite pieces of literature, which is the People's Constitution, which I think everybody, if you haven't seen it, you should get one and they should be given out to every school child uh, starting about the age of four. So, um, uh, but also is is uh, coming in with a, a master's from, from, I think, international studies on, uh, and so she applies all of that, but is an incredible leader at Hands for Hunger and, and has done really amazing work over there. Um, our other panelist is also no slouch. Uh, we have Kieran Smith, and Kieran is the president and CEO of One Luther Foundation, um, but also uh, made his way through in a number of different positions at One Luther, and prior to that, worked his way through a number of different positions at, at University of the Bahamas. Um, One Luther has, has been a partner of ours in building uh, organization. I mean, sector capacity and. Uh, they not only see a very have a very local approach, but also a very global one. So I'm looking forward to both of your thoughts. So uh, Keisha, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Sure, my pleasure. Thank you so much for that introduction, Matt. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel. Um, it's while you started off by saying that, you know, there might not be very many surprises in your presentation. And what I found most interesting was that there wasn't anything that shocked me, but there was still, it was really interesting to see it all kind of pulled together and presented in that way. And it really, really helped me to kind of get a clearer understanding of what the sector looks like, even though I am fully engaged in the sector and a part of it. It was really interested, interesting to kind of see the way you pull that together. Um, and it, helps me to formalize some of the things that I've been thinking, some of the things that I know Matt and I have been discussing and Kiran and I, and then Kiran and Matt, and then me and some of the attendees that I see on the panel, right? We, we constantly have these conversations with each other, around each other, but seeing it all pulled, to get pulled together really incentivizes me personally to say, hey, we are on the right track. We're doing the right things. We're moving in the right direction. We just need to um, kind of do it more deliberately, perhaps, I think is a part of it. Um, and I have, I mean, I have a lot to say, and I hope that we can kind of bounce ideas off of each other. Um, so if I may, I would just like to um, perhaps pull out some of the most interesting things that I found in the report, and then I can pass it over to Kiran, and then we can bring it all back together. Matt, is that okay? Perfect. Um, so as the leader of a nonprofit organization in the Bahamas, I first, second, and third, um, the sentiments that fundraising is difficult in this environment. It's not impossible. You know, I would be being dishonest if I said it was um, impossible, right? Hands for Hunger benefits from um, a number of um, kind of steady and regular funding streams that really keep us afloat, right? So I know that it is possible for a nonprofit to be successful in this environment, right? But I also know that there are quite a few missed opportunities for um, encouraging donations into the sector. Um, and I think that that is definitely something that um, perhaps collectively, we can kind of um, put forth ideas and kind of as a block, we can come together to encourage in, encourage the, the environment, right? And we're talking private businesses, we're talking the government, we're talking our visitors, right? To really see the sector as something that um, they should be investing in, right? And I definitely see that as something that we, we should do collectively and not individually. All right. Um, I like to say that there are enough millionaires and billionaires in the Bahamas for each of us to get one, right? One or two to kind of really be patrons of our organization and, and to fund our work. Um, and I think that that's another benefit of us existing in a relatively small space, 
right, that has very, very close access to larger spaces. And I think that that's something that we can really be using to our advantage, especially if we find a smart way to work together towards um, reaching our fundraising goals. Um, and another thing that I think really jumped out on me was the, um, the part about the impact, the impact on the people that we serve. Right. I, I found the responses um, surprising, right, in terms of how many people really feel the impact of our work. And I know that for some organizations like mine, right, it's very easy for someone to see how they've benefited from Hans for Hunger, right? Oh, I, I got some food from Hans for Hunger. Yes. Right. Take my name off. But I know that a lot of the work that um, the organizations in the sector do is not seen directly by the people benefiting from it, right? So I wonder if the sector is doing um, as good a job, perhaps communicating the effects of the work, the things that they aim to achieve with the work and how those achievements affect the people in the community, right? And then another conversation is if that really should be our work, right? If it, if, it, how important is kind of the long-term impact being attributed back to us, right? And how much of it is just doing the work, right? And I think as the sector grows, there's more room for more professionals to fill in the gaps, right? So whereas we have the organizations that are really um, interested in making sure that the job gets done, there are other parts of society and other parts of the sector that can focus on making sure that people in the community understand the value of what we're contributing, right? So those are the, the two main points. I can go on and on, but I would really like to hear from Kiran. I would really love to hear um, your thoughts on this, and then I hope we can tie it all back together. Thank you, Keisha. And, and Keisha, I mean, just pulling a few things, the, the trends that you were talking about are, you know, really keyed into sustainability, looking at the long term and being intentional in terms of how we can work collectively on that. We were able to do some training based on this, this study, the first two points of, of uh, looking at how capacity building and uh, collaboration, right? Those uh, fueled the training that we did over the last uh, summer and well, spring to summer. And we, we saw training on fundraising and advocacy and all of uh, these things, financial reporting, um, monitoring and valuation. Um, but undercurrent to all of it was this theme of how do we better collaborate and and work collectively. And I think that's something that ties into uh, what your point is. And I'm sure uh, we'll we'll pick up with with what um, we're going to hear from Kiran. So Kiran, uh, please let us know your thoughts. Well, thank you. I think the, the report um, uh, well done. And, and I just wanted to say thank you, Keisha. I think you touched on a lot of my points there, too. This report is definitely not a surprise. Uh, in my opinion, I agree with Keisha there. I think, I think what we're seeing in, in, in this report is really evident of what a lot of people feel in the space. So what stands out to me is the fundraising challenge. I think everybody across the board would say that's that number one thing. And you know, I remember that study we collaborated on, Matt, with that we did recently. And we looked at the, the the things in order of what was important to nonprofits. The first thing was fundraising. The second thing was programs and operations and then strategic planning and then governance. But what we didn't see or what we didn't recognize, I guess in some sense, is that in order for your fundraising to go up, your governance has to go up, your, your program and your outreach has to go up, and then also scaling up. What also stood out to me was the challenges around um the administration and you know i face this every day with one illusor in order for any organization to scale up it's going to need people to do that and if you already have a fundraising challenge and if you already have a fundraising challenge it's hard to hire the people to scale up so for me i you know just being in the day-to-day, -day. for for example, Wani Lusa has, you know, we have a training restaurant, hotel, farm. And to be caught in, in my previous role as a COO, I was in the operation, like in the day-to-day. -day. And, you know, being able to uh, become the CEO now, you recognize so much that 
you cannot be heavily in the day-to-day -day in order to grow and advance the organizations. And I think that's the, one of the biggest challenges a lot of nonprofits are, are facing because the executive directors, their CEOs, their presidents have to be so heavy in the day-to-day -day that they can't focus on growing their organization, looking for that million dollar funder that Keisha is talking about and spending their time traveling to find foundations that would support their mission and causes. And I think that I think they touched it in this presentation about finding uh, people, finding organizations and foundations that really care about community development and is not afraid to take that risk on your organization in terms of the administration. And if you can get those kind of organizations to invest in you and they can see the return on what they're investing in, then they'll continue to support you over and over. And I think that's something that this report also kind of infers and teaches us. Um, I also see in this case of a report is how do nonprofits become more bridge builders in this space? And when I say bridge builders, I think one of the things that we were, uh, were fortunate, especially with Sean, our, our founder at the time too, is being able to bridge the gap between the second home community, uh, residents, and being able to bring them together to support a mission and support a cause for a place that they love, that they come to all the time. And I think that is something that uh, a lot of nonprofits can possibly do in Nassau. Because that, like Keisha said, I think persons with the wealth, they're here. They're, they're, and they're all over the Bahamas. They're in Luther, they're in, in Abaco, they're in Nassau. It's there. It's just, how do we bridge the gap? And I think some of that starts from the governance aspect as well. Well, you know, in some instances, we've been fortunate to have, you know, board members that would bring their friends that may be involved in those different communities and they being able to tell our stories. So we have to not just tell our stories. We have to find people that can tell our stories for us as well. So I think that's another element that really stood out is, you know, that pair to pair fundraising, friend raising uh, and how you can get people to tell your story for you, I think is a, another big thing that stood out. Um, also. And I just going back to that point about um, scaling up. In order for our organizations to grow, we have to scale up. And 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 you cannot do that. Uh, you cannot scale up your organization. Like I said, if your executive director, if your 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 person is so bogged down in the day to day that they can't get ten thousand feet to see the strategic um, aspects of the organization as well as where they're going with their mission and vision. Uh, the other thing that stood out to me was, um, and I think we didn't touch on this, is the potential of social enterprises in the Bahamas and the earned revenue generation side. Because one of the key things that I think a lot of people look for when they are going to fund the organization is, what is your sustainability model? How are you, are you going to come back to me every year and ask for the same program, same thing every year? Um, so how can we now look at a, how can the civil society, how can nonprofits also look at revenue generating opportunities that can help sustain their programming? And I think when you, uh, and that's one of the things that we're doing, we're saying, hey, how do we get our farm to self-sufficiency in terms of being able to generate enough revenue to cover our operations so that the more we uh, uh, apply for programs, all of that, we can just pump that into programming. So I think coming up with some of those models in our nonprofits and, and also thinking of nonprofits as businesses um, and, and to, to a big extent would also help with the sustainability factor of, of running a nonprofit. And uh, I think a lot of us go into it for passion, <laughs> passion, and we burn that midnight oil every day. <laughs> uh, but I think it's so important that we also always look at how do we make our model more sustainable sustainable in that sense. Um, communications, um, I could tell, I, I could say that, that I think that's one of the biggest things that can drive um, nonprofits. Or one of the things you're seeing, like we've done some, you know, Tribune articles, we've done um, a number of videos, we've done, um, there's a number of things that just put, the information to just share what we're doing. Uh, it's amazing the power of social media and what it can do for your organization. But being able to get persons to, to connect with us in that sense 
because you have somebody who'll reach out to you and say, hey, I saw your, I saw your, your article, I saw your video, or I saw something, tell me more. And, uh, you know, passion, uh, Stefan says that passion alone cannot run your nonprofit in a sustainable way. And that's, and that's the, the truth of the matter. I remember when I was taking on this role, I remember Sean saying to me, Kiran, you have to get 10,000 feet. You have to get 10,000 feet to see the bigger picture. And if you get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, you're not focusing on growing the organization. So those are like some, some key things I think stood out. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to mention is the importance of growing civil society and being able to share our models that are working, share what's working, what's not working, what needs to change. But to be able to come into a space and share that with other persons, um, and I'm hoping, Matt, Keisha, that we can be able to work together on this this project uh, we've been talking about. But to really be able to share the share that models so that we can grow our organizations. And the one last thing before I jump off is the incentives. Fortunately, we've been able to create our incentives through having a 501c3 organization uh, and being able to get persons or visitors who may have a passion for what we're doing, or a passion for the island to be able to make contributions that would also incentivize them in some sense. So I think us as a body also need to look at, at ways of lobbying and advocating for more incentives. There's so many organizations that have corporate social responsibility platforms that would love to support a community or would love to support uh, um, an organization that's doing good in their community. And uh, I think, um, Civil society can also be that trust, trusted platform for a lot of persons who may not want to go the route of government um, in terms of development. They may say, hey, I trust in this nonprofit. I want to uh, put an investment there. But I think we have to find ways of how do we advocate for more incentives in that sense. And I think part of why it's a struggle in that, in that sense, because all of the incentives have been given before developed in doing these agreements before the developers get here. And so, you know, Am I really getting an incentive? You can already give me a tax-free zone, you know, somewhere. It's So I think we have to lobby and advocate for that more. Uh, it's interesting to see that government grants in this report um, went down during that period. And I'm wondering if that's because more nonprofits came into the space and were given more grants during the disaster relief, or it'll be interesting to dig into that, to, uh, to see that. I know um, Jose had mentioned that you know, a lot of governments are reducing their expenditure, but I I do think um, it'd be interesting to see and explore more uh, about that as well. So those are my comments, and I I think thank you so much for for inviting me, Matt. No, we're and uh, we we always uh, love the the optimism and the entrepreneurial spirit that one Luther brings forward. Um, and there was a lot of really practical and good examples in there. Um, underlying to everything we've talked about, and I think the biggest implication coming out of that uh, study is that there's tremendous potential. You know, the, we, the, the folks who we serve see the impact, they feel it, they know it, they, they speak about it, but we haven't brought that forward to our other areas, to government, to the, the private sector, to the potential funders. So I think that's something, and I know um, the three of us are working on something that we'll bring out publicly uh, in, in, a, in a short period, but um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, speaking of opportunity, though, we have some incredibly talented and resourceful folks who are on our uh, participant list. Um, Ariana, if you're okay to pick it up from here, I will hand it back over to you, and and then let let's get some of that the, the, some of those questions and some of those thoughts and ideas, and then everyone who's here on the panel will be available to respond as as needed. No problem. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, we can just jump right into it. So the first question is from an anonymous attendee, and they ask, which category in your breakdown are sports associations? So, Paul, I don't know if you would probably be the best person to answer that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm actually trying to remember, and Stefan's on here. Do you remember if we actually had respondents for many of the, like, Freedom Farm or any of the, the sports-based organizations in the end? I know we were doing a lot of work to try and get responses in from some of them, but again, we had a low response rate. Not, I'm honestly not sure they would have pretend like there's normally a whole 
aspect that's related to that type of interaction. So I'm thinking the fact that it wasn't a category, we may have had one response and it wouldn't have been in that those big six categories that we pulled up there. In the full report, you see the full listing, so. All right. Thank you as well. If you have a follow-up question, you can just drop it in the chat and I can read it off. The second question is from Natino Thompson. They ask, were CSOs who served marginalized and oppressed communities included? If so, were there any excluded or overlooked? For example, the LGBTQ law. Again, every I know that this was on you guys at org. Um, you did a remarkable job really trying to follow up with everybody. I know is an easy example only because I pestered Alicia a lot that equality. Well, Jose, I don't know if either of you are able to ask. Can you not hear me? Okay. Um, I can hear you. Uh, Ariana, Ariana, you're coming a little bit in and out, but we can definitely hear uh, hear you at 12. Okay. So I was just going to say that poor Licia, who was working on a project with me at the time, so I know for sure Equality Bahamas responded. Um, I know that it, groups that were specifically um, serving undocumented migrant and- Yeah, other, I, can, I can hear you now. Sorry, it's freezing. Okay. And other communities in Abaco um, were also included. Um, so I can at least say that some were. I, I definitely, we had like a 20% response rate, as was said, right? So there were, there were a whole bunch of organizations that didn't respond to org's quantitative survey. Um, if I may, I would like to just use this opportunity to kind of piggyback on what Etoile is saying and what what you said from the beginning in terms of the responses to the survey. And I think that, you know, that's another way in which we're lacking, um, you know, in this community. Um, I think that perhaps, I mean, I can, I can um, venture a guess, right? Perhaps there's a bit of a competitive spirit. Maybe we're afraid to kind of share too much information um, about ourselves with, you know, who can potentially be a competitor. Um, but I think that just, you know, our, our lack of enthusiasm in contributing towards data, I think, is part okay. of what's holding to, us back. Uh, because for some reason, there's a lag for me. Okay. All right. I'll just say quickly while Ariana um, tries to catch up. I think that, you know, our, our lack of enthusiasm and being a part of data collection is really holding us back, you know, as a sector, right? Um, Just the... um the kind of hesitancy we have toward um, participating in surveys, being a part of the conversation, sharing information and data um, about the work that we do, who we're touching. I think that, you know, that's a part of what's stopping us from really being able to move forward as powerfully as we can, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, just an appreciation for data and what it can do. And Kiran, you touched on this. Um, that's what donors wanna see, right? Donors wanna see data regarding you know what we've done, what we've been able to achieve, right? And if we had had more of the data, right? We would have had an even more powerful report to kind of put together, right? And so I think that data collection, um, participating in surveys is really something that collectively we can encourage our peers to do, encourage each other to do. And you know, I think, I think it comes down to, you know, in part wondering where the information would go. Right. So even though we we understand data collection, perhaps um, there's some skepticism in how data is used or how it's reported on, um, you know, but I think that we're really seeing a change in, you know, the, the use of data and the regard for data um, globally and locally as well. So I think that that's something that we can do to help ourselves, right, to help ourselves move forward and to help ourselves make a better case for all the things that we need. And Keisha, I'm going to jump on there just for two seconds more, just to go on the collaborative effort, because it's something that I love to bring up and I haven't yet. And I know that half of the panel participants in this forum are in the group anyway, but I love what Dr. Lino Davis has done with beings, right? It's such a great example of by being a coordinated group, mainly focused on environmental areas, but a 
we've sort of expanded a little bit beyond that. It has increased funding opportunities for all Bahamian CSOs working in that space. It has allowed for greater educational training, capacity building experiences. So many things come together when we are sharing with one another. Um, and so just a hundred percent, you should say, I agree. Also as somebody who does data collection for a living, I 100% really want to push that in there that the more data, the more data um, that we can collect, the more powerful our voice is as a group. So just fully agree. Just to chime in one bit on that, because I think that's so crucial. Um, setting a culture where we're going to build trust, where we're going to have comfort, where we're going to know all of that stuff is really going to be critical for that. We we went we went as far and as deep as we could and created as many incentives for this. But it, it was a time when everybody was in a space of scrambling for themselves. So we know that as we do this going forward, we need to go, you know, sometimes we're going to need to walk through the streets and go to physical spaces and track folks down and have coffee to help them fill out these things because it's just going to take that kind of intense work to get this data out. But once it's there, hopefully that even opens up a space where we're all better connected and, and more able to, to participate in using that data. I mean, and just strategically, right, being seen as transparent just helps um, organizations be seen as legitimate um, and, you know, being respected by potential donors, by um, other civil society groups, by the communities in which you um, hope to serve. So transparency should be a part of our model anyway, you know, so in that case, sharing data um, you know, of course, following best practices and guidelines regarding confidence, of course, all of that aside, you know, sharing data really is in our best interest on so many different sides. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, jump in for for Ariana since uh, they're they're experiencing lags. Um, another question that we got in the Q&A was um, from Amanda Mary Lewis uh, asking, were there any stark differences in uh, capacity between volunteer and professionally uh, managed CSOs? So quantitatively, no, um, just because honestly, our sample size was so small anyway to start with when you try and start disaggregating down into these little things. Qualitatively, what I can tell you from when I was doing interviews was that, yes, that's just what does happen. So an organization, I mean, it's going off of what Kiran really said, right? An organization that's got a board structure, that's got a five-year strategic plan, that has a monitoring and evaluation framework, they are, they've already gone through so much in terms of their capacity building. And then they are also the same group that have more, more formalized structures, have employees, they have that whole setup. The one that is a one person show that they're volunteering their time and then they're asking additional folks to volunteer. They may not have a board structure. They're not actually registered. They may be doing a lot of very good work. I don't wanna say that that's not happening, but generally the scale of the work that they're doing is smaller. Um, and it's just the way that it goes. And I do think that those, that group of CSOs can almost be broken then down into two different groups. One, that they've been doing this for 15 years and that's what they like doing. And they're very good at their niche thing that they're doing. And they have their crew of friends and family and other folks that are contributing to it. And they don't have a growth plan. That's what they're doing. That is their, that is their work. And then there are others that they're, I would say they're generally newer. They're going to be a younger organization and they really are looking for how can I grow? How can I get more funding in? What are these tick boxes? And a lot of, a, a number of those CSOs, they just don't even know. They don't know what the process is to become a registered not-for-profit. They don't know what the process is for them to be able to get the bank account after becoming a not for Do I have to get an NIB number? Do I have to get a TIN number? Do I have to like... There are so many administrative and bureaucratic bits and pieces that if right now I'm just volunteering my time with a couple of people, there's a lot of like these administrative stuff. And I know that this is what one Eleuthera um, together with org has been assisting with sort of creating, you know, civil society Bahamas has been doing like, these are the steps you have to take 
to become more formalized. It's still, I think there's still some more um, assistance that can be provided to that type of CSO. And again, it's, I, I cannot give you quantitative numbers to say statistically significantly, you know, to point four and that this is the thing, but that is definitely what I would say. And, and one last point, Charles, I think to some extent, some people don't want to scale up because it's sometimes these bureaucratic and administrative things suck the life and fun out of the, the vision and mission and thing that they, they're so passionate about. And, you know, it's something you see when uh, some persons, you know, they transition from a less formal structure into a more formalized structure in terms of how you run your operation. It can sometimes feel life draining um, when you just want to do the thing that 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 you're passionate about. So I'll say that. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's why capacity building is so important, right? That's why understanding, you know, the role of a CEO in an organization and the role of an operations manager and a, a community organizer, understanding all of these roles and how all of them are crucial to the success of a nonprofit really um, would help you help you play the the best role that you can play in your organization. You know, and on that note, I have to point out, if you've been looking at the papers lately, there are so many um, advertisements for paid work in this the CSO sector. I mean, that has been really encouraging. There are so many organizations and groups that are working in the country that are um you know, based in the country and looking for professionals to join the team to do this important work on that level. Thanks. Uh, we have Juliet with the a raised hand. So I'll go ahead and uh, let Juliet uh, ask her question. We are running out about of time, but we're going to try to get a few few more questions in if everyone's all right with that. Okay, great. Can you hear me? You can go ahead. We can hear you. Yes, okay. we hear Okay, wonderful. I'll just make it very quick. So Juliet, deal with Hopetown Zero Waste. Um, one of the questions that I've raised a few times, um, Atwal and Matthew, I know we've chatted about it a little bit in Atwal. Thank you for raising that about beings. Um, and Kiran and Keisha, what you've been talking about in terms of funding, we're totally volunteer based and we're, uh, we're scaling up. We're starting a membership program is a centralized portal um, that really provides number one, uh, all of the events uh, within on a national level that uh, would speak to different organizations so that we can put it on our calendar and plan. I find right now, if you're not part of these beings groups or other groups, you miss out on the opportunities or by the time you actually find out about them, it's too late because especially in the out islands, you have to plan and it's financially uh, sometimes um, hard for us to do that. The second is also a uh, list of funders, right? Um, it's such a time consuming um, process to write grants that it's uh, sometimes hard. And by the time you find out you have five days to write this grant and you think, well, I don't know if I really can squeeze that in and if I'm even going to be competitive to do that. And, um, and then the final one is around um, actually like helping in terms of grant writing. Um, for myself, I do the grants that we're applying for, but I would venture to say that a lot of other really small scale um, CSOs probably struggle to um, to hone in on exactly what that funder might be looking for within a grant. So those were just a couple of my key points. Thank you for a fabulous uh, presentation and everything that you guys have been doing. Thank you. And I'll just quickly respond. I don't know if Karen is still here in the participants group or not, um, but uh, I think, let me see. No, I think she's, she's gone now. But so Karen Panton from uh, Bahamas, uh, protected Areas Fund. I know she has helped quite a bit with doing some grant writing symposia. And Matt, I think you guys might have done one as well, but without a doubt, it's one of the things that I get asked a lot about, like, can you help me write a grant? And I'm like, I would love to, but no, um, because it is such a time intensive art <laughs> as well as a skill. Um, so definitely a, a huge area. And the calendar, you know, 
for a while, um, Jason from Bahamas Local was sort of assisting and he would put up a bunch of stuff. I don't know if we could go back to him. I don't know what the best way to 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 maneuver in that space, but it's definitely true for anything that, and I don't know if Nikita's still on as well, but Katrina has the same issue. Kieran, you probably do too. You know, like you're in Eleuthera. There's some event going to be happening in Nassau. You buy a ticket to come to Nassau and then you find out like on the day you arrive that they've canceled the event because also the communication hasn't been bad. Mm. Hey, it's a breathe in, breathe out situation. So just saying, Juliet, I don't really have an answer for that. But uh, but if that is something that the gurus at org could continue to focus on a little bit, it would it would be awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll chime in with a with a quick plug. Um, our training that we did over the summer, uh, the Civil Society Cluster Training, we did have a whole section on fundraising. Um, grant writing is an incredible, important, talented uh, component, and I would encourage we continue to do it. However, what we haven't explored is the opportunities with individuals that Keisha and Kieran spoke about. We haven't explored and get better, stronger engagement with uh, with our corporate partners. We haven't necessarily engaged with how we engage the diaspora of folks who are out there from the Bahamas in other spaces doing really, really well and bringing them back in through these vehicles. So the first plug is you can go to uh, org Bahamas backslash civil society. Uh, Stefan, tell me if I'm wrong on that. And you can check out the whole list of all the trainings that are available to you. The, the PowerPoints are there. So there's a lot of tips on how to write grants, on how to develop relationship-based fundraising. Um, we are going to be doing more of that training in the coming year in different spaces. And so we'll we'll uh, we'll seek funding to be able to bring it to a, a broader audience. But we want to make sure, you know, before you start paying for all those grant writing courses, check out what we have for free first. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and uh, we will, I think, as a second, have to figure this out. And particularly, I want to re reinforce uh, Kieran's point of we collectively need to lobby that there should be incentives uh, to donate to our organizations, whether it be in disaster times or others. And I think we can make that case uh, with the collective effort and resources we even have just on this call. So and Matt, I'm just going to, I know we're out of time, but I'm going to give my last little plug is an easy, low hanging fruit. And there's like 50 others out there that if we came together, it would be easy to do. So anytime you buy a ticket on Expedia, you can give $2 to, you know, offset your carbon footprint or you can do this, but none of the Bahamian airline sites, Bahamas Air doesn't do it. None of them, Bahama Go doesn't do it. There are so many little opportunities that if we, and I know our cruise ship passengers are different, but if you tapped into the 7 million plus tourists that we are having and just gave them each an opportunity to give a dollar from really simple. You're buying a tour. So you're going on powerboat adventures. You're going on all of these things. Would you like to give $5 towards whatever it happens to be? And then it's just a funding pool has nothing to do with government. This is not going to the consolidated funds. This is coming from private sources into a private pool. There's lots of low hanging fruit out there from our tourism industry that we could be benefiting from. So just throw that out there. It's it's funny you said that because I think that's actually a, a good point to all. That's actually something one of the things we're exploring. We have an organization, for example, that sells um, a product, and they said for every case of this product that they would sell, they would consider giving a three dollar donation per case. And I think those as small as that is to, in some person's mind, that is just that's low hanging fruit, like you said, and it's a starting block for a lot of organizations. Great, thank you. Um, so I will take us through the final questions. I know we are out of time, so I'm gonna consolidate this to the best of my ability. One question I see posted was for us speaking about uh, that we hosted the custard training in 2023, and will the course be offered again? We are currently in the works of finalizing our strategic plan and a few of our plans to do some uh, cluster uh, nonprofit trainings rather, so that information will be posted. We do try to make sure that our outreach is as inclusive as possible across sectors, types of organizations and islands. Um, so Jessica, I would just, uh, we'll reach out to make sure that we have your contact details. Um, the list that we're currently using of our most recently engaged organizations probably includes maybe six to eight different islands, um, but we will definitely be intentional about making sure that uh, our training opportunities for nonprofits are available for folks across the islands. Um, and so while I'm gonna field these last two questions to you, 
Um, one was from Nikita, which may have somewhat of a shorter answer because it, it's a very uh, viable concern and a pretty straightforward question. And she asks how many of the budgets, speaking to the budgets of the nonprofits reported, are real. And she says that her experience is that even with orgs with small budgets is probably not a true representation of the effort and real costs um, of the organization. Um, so I don't know if you have a quick response to that. Yeah, I, so I, I had done a quick type response, um, but I'll I'll just verbalize it a little bit, which was just to say that, agree. So we can't quantitatively tease it out because people put in their budgets. However, what I know from talking to them is, this is why we see such a high um, proportion of organizations being dependent on volunteers. You don't have the financial ability to hire people. So you get a friend who's an accountant to do the accounting services or to do the legal services or or to do anything and everything that you can do. It's a friend with a truck who's moving your boxes. They have to go to the school, whatever it is. Those are never costed. In-kind goods and services for us here are rarely actually budgeted for. I cannot tell you though, Nikita, if that equals like 30% on top or like 200% on top. I'm really, and I think it would probably vary that the larger organizations probably have it be a smaller proportion of their budgets are really in kind goods and services. And then the the smaller ones, it's it's much bigger, but that would be my gut. That being said, Keisha, I don't know if her hands for hunger because you're a very formalized organization. Do you have a dollar value like for all of your donated food in that you receive in from the hotels and restaurants? Because it's difficult to put a dollar value on these types of things, right? Um, and yeah, I'll I'll just kind of be candid with us, right? We're talking about um, making sure that we we think holistically when running a nonprofit. So yes, hands for hunger, we are extremely formalized, and yes, we we do have a dollar value for the amount of food that's donated, right? We established that dollar value in 2008 when we started. And it was only in 2024 that we realized that we've been using outdated numbers, right? So for 15 years, we've been saying $1 equals one pound of food. And for each pound of food collected, we um we accounted for that as a dollar worth of donation. And, you know, it took our very involved board of directors and professionals and me, who's very much engaged to realize that number has obviously changed since 2008. Inflation is real, right? Things are real. So yeah, we're actually right now in the process, uh, the process of updating that figure and trying to actually figure out, you know, how much a pound of food is worth in 2024 dollars. And um, Mr. Pacheco, maybe I'll give you a call and you can help me really put a real number to that. <laughs> and the very uh, last question, uh... Uh, I think I will feel this back to you again as well um, that we'll take for today. Um, Natino says that I've noted a glaring gap in the report. There's no mention of uh, government organized NGOs or gongos. And for a fact that they do exist here, uh, there is a common, common informal practice by the Bahamian government to use gongos, which are usually, but not always faith based organizations to fund or carry out programs to meet critical needs of citizens. These gongos are often led by party supporters, supporters, relatives, and or friends. And this informal practice not only undermines grant funding opportunities, but the efficacy of the work that CSOs with no political affiliation are doing in the country. Um, and he asked, can we, or can you, us, whoever, <laughs> address this gap in, in the report? And I guess that would look at potential subsequent work. So I'm not sure if you have a quick response. I'll so put it back to what Keisha already said. If you don't respond to the survey, you don't get included. Sorry. It's so it's, uh, you know, and bongos in general, it's not just the Bahamas either, right? Like we know this goes on. Um, we have a much more specific thing that is different here that we didn't really talk about, Matt, but there was this is much less, sorry, my dog is waking up. Apologies, everybody. Um, But significantly fewer, this was not a focus on faith-based organizations at all. This was, it was sort of done in a, the way the methodology ended up that it was going to be only like two that had responded. It wasn't going to be representative at all. So that's why they're almost entirely excluded. You'll see there's a big thing in the report that, that talks about this exclusion. Um, it would be an interesting area for future uh, analysis. I, I would just point out specifically, I don't know if I would necessarily agree that it undermines all of the other stuff. Because if you're doing good grant 
writing and getting grants in from international sources, trust me, being a gongo is not in your favor, right? This is where being a Hands for Hunger or an org or a one Eleuthera, a brief, a Friends of the Environment, any of the other amazing organizations that were listed here, you're going to do much better in your grant writing um, for international dollars coming into the country than, than anyone who is seen to have a potential, let's just say, political background to you. I will also just cast to the future. Um, we've been talking for the last year collectively, a number of us on this call and, and uh, some funders about how critical it is that we do a more exhaustive uh, mapping of the sector now, that we, we really get access to more immediate data and we do a more extensive process where we understand and get these nuances so that we can ensure that marginalized communities are included. Uh, you know, I mean, we've seen this in our own ins instances when you don't go to the family islands, you're not going to get that information. You're not going to find the people that are in small communities that are remote doing fantastic things. So, so we need to figure this out. We're we're, we're continuing to try and seek out funding and partners, uh, and anybody who's willing and interested in working with us on that, we're we're really open and available. Please let us know. So, I'll hand it over to Stefan for our closing. Right. So um, I just want to say on behalf of of Org and on all of the organizations represented here, thank you all so much. Um, I think that we all agree that uh, the, the organization and the, the potential that civil society has in the Bahamas is something that we have to continue to put effort to. Um, if you've been in any of the discussions that many of us have referenced, you would hear me say, I'm tired of talking about getting organized, let's just do it. And I believe that, <laughs> I believe that this is an important um, first step. So um, as we continue to do this work, um, I would just echo the sentiments, um, particularly of its wall, when these opportunities to do these surveys and, and get on board and participate come up, what we're able to do will be predicated on those um, that, that partner with us and participate. And many nonprofits, we, we all know that the, the actual work, the technical parts of our work, even for those of us that are in leadership, getting out of the, the weeds and trying to get to, as Kiran said, the 10,000 feet in the air is sometimes challenging because we are, as, a, as a, a planet, we're challenged. As a country, we're challenged. And we all uh, have that passion and want to help. But the reality is we will truly magnify what we're able to do, how we're able to support one another, how we're able to build networks that not only help our communities and our people, but also help other nonprofits that might have a deficiency in an area or, or an area for growth um, in an area that another another organization might be very good at and can pass on some of that knowledge. And so this space creates opportunities for NGOs um, and CSOs to come together, uh, not just for the sake of, of the crucial work that we do out in the communities that does contribute to sustainable development and international development, but also that builds the sector and helps to equip us as organizations to function efficiently. So, you know, we don't have to spend every weekend and every holiday and every break um, at our desks and out in the field and doing all the incredible things that we know we're probably still going to do, but at least the world won't stop if we work, <laughs> if we work together to make sure that we create a landscape where we could be a bit more successful, a bit more uh, effective, and even more respected in the eyes of the other sectors and, and of course, of, of the people. Uh, so we just want to thank you so much for taking your time out, for going 11 minutes over with us today. Um, and you can look out on our social media pages uh, for more information on, on, on the work that we are doing. And if you would like to reach out to partner to support or get involved in this work, uh, you can email us at info at orgbahamas.com. Um, and we will be sure to respond and let you know what's, what's upcoming, what's in the pipeline. Um, and if there are any other organizations that you feel may be interested or involved, particularly marginalized groups, family island groups that may not always get access to the information, we've made a commitment um, that we will do the best that we can to bring more voices to the table. Because regardless of the size of these NGOs and CSOs that we're a part of, we all have a, a really pertinent role to play in the developments that are necessary. Uh, so thank you everyone once again. Natino, I saw you had one more question and we'll be sure to get the response directly to you. Um, but we will keep the, the lines of communication open um, on this really, really important uh, topic. And I trust that everyone will enjoy the rest of your day and look out for more uh, from us. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.